Welcome again to the Alex Goldstein Property Show, the number one rated property show on Stray FM. We aim to solve all your property queries and to demystify the property sector. We have some amazing tips plus industry expert information. If you need that property fix, then connect with the Alex Goldstein social media accounts to get the best property advice whenever you need it. Now, in this month's show, we will be getting the inside track from John Charters Reed, a building surveyor with some very distinct differences, and who tips us off about the next major scandal in the banking sector, which, believe it or not, could be bigger than PPI. We're also joined by Chris Worsley from Easy Fireplace, who gives us expert insight into this sector. So much to fit in, so we're straight on with it. Property News with Alex Goldstein. Stray FM. This month, we're talking about the secret to instructing a great estate agent. Now, when it comes to this, our most important asset, our home, regularly have conversations with homeowners who are getting themselves in an absolute spin. And they all say, well, look, is it any wonder? From their perspective, estate agents all look the same, they're going to say the same, and they claim to do the same for their beloved home. Many believe that there are just three main criteria to choose from when they're looking to instruct an agent. However, all of these have got major flaws, and let me explain. So firstly, guide price. Now, rightly or wrongly, this subject alone seems to consistently come at the top of everyone's list. Vendors understandably feel flattered when an estate agent exudes confidence in selling their home, and especially when a guide price is quoted towards the upper end of the range. Now listen, agents of course know this, and many quote enthusiastic figures just to get your instruction. At the end of the day, anyone can quote a high guide price, so you've got to look beyond this to get the right agent. The second criteria is fees. Now estate agents are salespeople. If you agree on a commission structure that's sensible for both sides, the agent's going to remain proactive right up until the point of exchange. However, Many vendors feel that if they nail that agent right down on commission, then they've made a saving. In actual fact, they've instantly disincentivized that agent and it's unlikely now they're going to push for a top figure. So fees also need to be put to one side. The third benchmark lies in how professional the agent was in their pitch. They're on the most part well-dressed, they've got boundless enthusiasm and obviously they've got confidence in selling your home. Of course, they love your property, which salesperson sat in your home is going to tell you otherwise. So again, this point needs to be treated with caution. So if it's not about high guide prices, low fees and a professional pitch, what do you really need to look at when picking the right agent? The answer, of course, lies with their front of house team. These are the people sat in the estate agent office who meet and greet potential buyers walking into the branch, deal with phone inquiries, website requests, know the properties, sell them effectively and have an intrinsic knowledge of the buyer database. The valuer sat in your living room is going to handle an element of those, but it's their team back at the office who's going to engage with all the buyers and the sellers whilst they're out. And most importantly, they are going to push your property from being under offer to exchange. So, my advice is before you go and instruct an agent, go and mystery shop them as a prospective purchaser. See how engaging, knowledgeable and proactive the front of house team are. Find a team that is exceptional and suddenly you're going to find that the estate agent's guide price, fees and presentation take on a whole new meaning. Very privileged indeed to have in the studio with me Chris Worsley from Easy Fireplace. Chris, thanks so much indeed for coming by. Just talk everyone through your business. It's a bit more unusual than most, I think. Yeah, my pleasure um, to be here, Alex. Um, Our business, um, it's based in Huddersfield. Um, Easy Fireplace is what's known as a bricks and mortar uh, showroom and business. That basically means you can come along, touch and feel, um, experiment with the fireplaces, um, play with them, see how they work, um, and basically get a gist of what the product is and what it does. But you you cover a whole sort of entity. It's not just the sort of the, the mantelpieces, so to speak, that go over it. It's much more than that. Yeah, the aspect of the fireplace industry is so much more than what is known as the mantle or the surround. Yeah, uh, we do the fireplaces. Um, we do them bespoke, made from limestone, marble, uh, wood, cast iron, black granite. You've then got things like the uh, the gas fires, you've got your inset fires, your outset fires, uh, your wall hung fires, um, you've then got your stoves, 
Um, you've got your wood burners. Um, you've got your multi fuel burners. It's Crikey, is there anything you don't actually stock or dare I say um, know about? This could be quite a technical conversation, I think. Yeah, I mean, from from the business in, it's um, it's a little village called Millsbridge, which is in Huddersfield. Um, we've got over 180 products on display Gosh. that we can demonstrate. Um, it's a case of coming in and we get the product right for you in yep. your home. Um, mm. It's not about selling a product. It's yep. about selling something that's perfect for the home and how you're going to use it. Mm. I, mean, I mean, it's been quite interesting. I mean, what what have the changes that you've seen in the market in recent years? Uh, I, I know sort of the, the oil price, for example, is all over the place. And I, I don't know whether you've just seen as a direct result whether there's been an upsurge in, in business. The the main thing that's that's changed is um, it's all about performance of what you what you're purchasing. With the economic uh, crisis that we all went through, everyone started looking after the pound. Our money is very virtual, yeah. Um, and so are our heating bills. Then once a month we get slapped with a bill, and that's when the virtual becomes reality. <laughs> yeah. um, so suddenly it's well, how can we stop this virtual money becoming such a big reality check at the end of each month? So so people people get seeing as you said the bill land on the doormat once a month thinking well that's quite a lot to be forking out for my gas oil whatever you're running off and then people are switching i dare say to sort of stoves and fire alternatives there is quite a lot of things um in the industry uh, that have changed basically the stove market shot up the the stove market went right through the roof um everyone wanted wood burning because they thought it was an ideal solution yeah um to make their heating bills a lot cheaper is that is that true is that is that the case um it actually wasn't um we as a company uh, my decision was not to join that rat race mm. basically everyone was selling stoves based on no knowledge uh, no information given to the customers and it, the, the stove and the idea behind the stove basically sold itself it is yep. a beautiful product mm. you've got the warm romantic flames um, you've got the heat from it. Um, it brings back memories of grandparents, um, brings back memories of holidays in cottages. Whatever it would be, an open fire brings back and triggers memories. And that's basically how the industry romantically rose through the It turned into years. a big sort of marketing campaign on the, on the, on the stove kind front. Of did. But what, what, why didn't it work out for people, um, do you feel? It, it's a little bit... The, the stoves are a really, really great product, and if it's used correctly, it can be a good heating source. The main thing is the cost. The cost of wood has gone up. The cost of coal has gone up. Mm. So the cost of actually fueling that appliance has gone up, so now it, it's just not that cost-effective. I suppose the, the other thing that often crops up um, is that people really want a fire, and you always traditionally think that you need a... A chimney or a chimney breast that you can actually utilize but i think i'm right in saying that that nowadays you don't necessarily need to actually have a chimney at all there are other options open to you the industry has gone down a little bit of a line of um, interior design uh, you walk into the room you assess the room you assess the, uh, the even even things like the shape of the room uh, the window is it a bay window has it is it a curve is it a hexagon shape is it straight um the, the room layout, even before you think about the appliance and the product you're going to sell the customer, with our, ourselves, that's first and foremost because it's not about the sale. I, I, yeah, and I thought it was short, surely on sort of stoves and fires. I just thought it, most people just look at what's the output, try and match it with a vague sort of room dimension, and, they, and then, then you're done. But it's, it's more than that, is it? That's the way that a lot of shops and uh, showrooms still work yeah. because it's all about the sale. With ourselves, it's about... Um, yes, it's about the here and now, but it's about the future. How is it going to best work for the family? There's many things. Is are they, Have they got children now? Or are they expecting children? Did they plan for children in the room? So therefore, we don't want to take up too much space in the room because the child is going to be playing. So therefore, we might not go for a false chimney breast. We might go for an inset balance flue fire, which could be either a hole in the wall or inset. Just talking through the flue option there, as you said, if you don't have the chimney, that there's a flue option that you can basically, as long as you've got yeah. an external wall, you can make it happen. If, yeah, if it's on an external wall, you've got um, you've got your power flue option, which basically is um, it's a hole in the wall which has got an external fan, and that pulls the products of combustion out and through the wall. Um, with that, the downside is you get a draft when the fire's not on, yeah. and if you ever had a power cut. Um, 
the the gas can't come through um, the best market now is balanced flue um, which is basically a glass fronted high efficiency gas fire the range from around about 80 percent up to in excess of 90 uh, percent efficiency crikey so in in terms of efficiency because a lot of people don't understand efficiency um, we created like a layman's terms of how how to understand efficiency mm. if you physically put one pound of gas into a fire it's how much heat you get on your legs yeah and so for a glass fronted fire you're talking 80 to 90p into the room onto your legs the rest of it is lost through the flue um through the products of combustion yeah, latent yeah. heat um many different things um you've then got your open fronted fires and with them they range from around about 50 to 75 percent efficient but the industry has changed quite a lot mm. and it is now a lot more focused around energy efficiency and is that is that is that the new frontier at the moment is that where the latest technology is being ploughed into into the industry it's all about energy efficiency or are there are there any other avenues as well being looked at um the industry went down a different route so they went to uh, the glass fronted now the glass fronted industry um peaked quite a lot but the cosmetic side of it wasn't as good and wasn't as appealing as yep. open fronted fires an open fronted fire you've still got even when the fire's off you've got the look of the coals or the logs or the pebbles you can physically touch them you can, so and you can see them a lot easier so cosmetically they're a lot more appealing but the efficiency rating isn't as high yeah um so then you've got the glass fronted fires so you've got the glass in front you've got the coals or the other cosmetic whether it's logs or pebbles behind and cosmetically it doesn't look as nice because you've got a reflection or a shadow yeah so the industry went through a big change and the glass fronted fires now they're a lot more appealing uh, the fuel beds have changed and they, it's whether it's the angle um, or the cosmetic look of them the glass is now non-reflective um, there's, there's a lot of changes so the glass fronted market for the high efficiency has improved a lot yeah but the open fronted as well as um, because there's now a different category so you've got high efficiency you've now got open fronted and then you've got open fronted high efficiency the open fronted is if you look at the fire and the face of the fire you've got um what what i call is face value yeah how much air can be drawn through that face at any given time now with a glass fronted it's it's minimal because there's a glass air as you can imagine there's not yeah, much air to pull through yeah. um, it only pulls through the top of the fire and through the bottom now with the open fronted fire the face value is a lot more dramatic because you've just got the canopy and then all the coals or whatever yep. the cosmetic layout is so you've then got the open fronted he mm. so you it's still open you've still got all the cosmetic stuff um but the canopy is slightly bigger yeah and then they've got a convector on there as well so the face value is actually reduced so the visual look of it you see less of the fuel bed but cosmetically it's still more pleasing Chris, thanks so much. And also, if people want to get in touch with you, what, what are the best ways? Um, you can contact us uh, via telephone, and that's um, Huddersfield 01484 64464, or you can visit our websites. Um, you've got easyfireplace.co.uk, or you've got envyfireplaces.co.uk. Uh, we do cover all of Yorkshire, so please don't hesitate to get in contact, and we're here to help. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed again, Chris. Thank you. The Property Hospital, Stray FM. The Property Hospital is all about me answering your property concerns and demystifying the process. Now, this week, I'm answering a question from Tom, who's got this to say. Hi, Alex. I'm thinking of going on the market because I've seen a property that I like. But if I don't get it, I don't know what to do. I'd really appreciate your insight on this, please. Tom, look, please be careful here, and you're absolutely right to ask. Remember that nowadays the market is very transparent, and there's lots of websites out there recording all sorts of information about your potential house sale. Now, as soon as you launch onto the open market, these websites effectively press record, and you start leaving what's called a digital footprint. Now, this is actually quite difficult to get rid of. I say this because if you're going to go onto the market, then you must do it for the right reasons and have a plan B 
if you do not secure that property that you ideally want. It's not advisable nowadays to dip your toe into the water and test the market only to find that the property you wanted has gone under offer. You then withdraw your property from the market and you leave behind the digital footprint that can be looked at in years to come. And You don't want to give the market the wrong impression about your home when you really do want to sell when that time comes. So overall, my advice is if you want to sell, then do it for all the right reasons and to go for it. If you just wish to test the market to gauge a reaction or indeed try and secure just that one single property, then I'd almost hold back and question your motivations to sell. If you're unsure, you only need to give me a call. I hope this helps. The Property Hot Seat. Stray FM. Name. John Charters Reed. Business. Charters Reed Surveyors. Years experience. 25. We've got John Charters Reed here in the studio, a very interesting chap indeed. Now, John, just tell everyone you've got a few accreditations to your name, which is uh, a bit more unusual than most surveyors out there, I think it's fair to be said. Yeah, definitely. I began my career as a classically trained York Minster joiner, went on to become a chartered surveyor, a chartered builder, uh, and I'm also a chartered building engineer. Crikey. You've got a lot going on there, a lot going on. And um, I think it's what's quite interesting is because you've got the building background, um, I think there was quite a famous story involving that as well. There was. We've had a few incidences where properties have suffered from structural movement. No one would uh, didn't know what to do or fix them, so we took our own digger, underpinned it, and we guaranteed it ourselves. That's what you call an in-house one-stop surveyor shop. I don't know many surveyors that will go and survey a property and then go and fix it and guarantee it themselves. Quite impressive stuff. I, I, I just want to sort of talk through the different types of survey. I think there are a lot of home buyers out there and indeed home sellers that get themselves into a bit of a spin as to what what level they require and what the actual differences are. Just just talk everyone through that. OK, well, be- before we do it, let's just look at the, the reason why you have a survey and at the moment it's all the wrong way around because there's a basic there's a basic valuation which tells you what the property is worth and in essence that's a it's a, it's a bank valuation usually and you're lucky if it's one sheet of paper you don't normally get to see it as the property purchaser now it's it's slightly incorrect because how do you know what the property is worth if you don't know its condition and for that reason Alex that's why you should have a survey first before you get the valuation. You know, I, I looked I looked around a, a 1649 property a few weeks ago and it had horrendous defects and it, it does have an effect on value. Needless to say, the cost of repairs is not a straightforward deduction off the market appraisal. No, indeed. And I mean, what, what, are, what are the survey types? Just, just, just so what we have is, what is, you is your basic survey is the industry standard is the RICS home buyers report it's quite a restrictive report because it has traffic lights in it and we we often do four or five surveys a week where someone's had the RICS home buyers report it's not clear uh, it's not easy to understand and we've been asked to do a subsequent report to it just to highlight effectively what the deficiencies are in there. And, and is it often uh, where banks, I suppose, offer that? Because sometimes they do this overall package saying, well, we'll give you a survey, and I guess very often, because it's the the lower grade one, exactly. it's slightly cheaper for them. So, so, the, so, so, so the banks have been rather naughty because one of the things I've said in, in my book, which, as you know, is how to be a smarter house Indeed. buyer, is that the banks, the banks are they're not treating customers fairly, the carrying out restrictive practices because if you go to the bank for a mortgage and they offer you a mortgage they must they must give you the opportunity to get your own independent surveyor what what is then the next type of so the, survey so that you, you you need to get most most individual private practices will, will offer their own version of that, which is usually full of common sense and not standard phrases. So you get your level two scheme, which is one above evaluation. Then you get your building survey, which is suitable for older houses. And what you must remember is that Yorkshire has got a plethora of terraced houses, you know, most of them getting on for 120 years old, and they too are likely candidates for a building survey. So the, 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 the sort of the step two, if you like, the next grade up, and I think some surveyors call it an infrastructure survey. Um, well, sometimes they call, it's yeah, different sometimes it's, it's got a number of names. It's, it's Sometimes it's called a building survey or a main structure survey. And you need to be extremely careful because 
There's a number of companies out there offering a building survey, charging a fortune, and it's four pages long. How long are yours then? 40 to 50 pages long and, and 40 to 70,000 words because the thing that everyone needs to understand is that your home that you are buying is ostensibly the family silver. And so why would you, why would you skimp? on going for the cheapest survey on something that's worth literally thousands and it's your future. No, I, I quite agree. I quite agree. And again, I think there's confusion over sort of formal valuations and sometimes I think estate agents offer these. Under what circumstances would someone say, I want a formal valuation? What are they and in, in, in what situation? So, so formal valuations usually begin with a probate valuation or evaluation for tax purposes or a matrimonial valuation. The banks will ask for a valuation because it, it's part of the Banks and Building Societies Act and regulations that the bank need a valuation to know the property's value. Yep. And so the, the banks are, are quite canny because they'll, they'll, they'll charge customers up to six, seven hundred pounds for a valuation, which literally is one to two pieces of paper, and they'll keep 60 to 70% of the fee, but they won't tell you that. No, indeed, indeed. But you, can you get involved if I needed? I needed a, a formal valuation. So there's no, there's no reason, there's no reason based on what we've previously said about the council of mortgage lenders, why a house buyer cannot insist on their own survey. If the bank turns around and says, "Oh no, you need to use our panel or approved surveyors," it's restrictive practice and it's tantamount to being illegal. It is because you, you, you've. you've Again, you've gone very specific. You've ruled out a lot of other sort of options, and at the end of the day, the client or the homeowner, or indeed the house purchaser, is 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 actually losing out at the end of the day. After all, you can choose your own solicitor, you can choose your own accountant, and you can choose your own mortgage advisor. So we need to be we need to be quite clear that the banks have got to stop behaving like this. And I've spent you know I've spent five years researching this, plus my 25 years in the business, in order to create the book which I've written. So this is the as you said this. Is, this is the next horizon. This is the next sort of scandal in in the banking world potentially, because it is, certainly sounds as though it's heading that way. Definitely, we've already spoke to a couple of law firms that are interested in setting up departments to actually tackle what is effectively almost like an in-house type of mortgage fraud by the banks, really. Yeah, yeah. So sort of setting up an, a monopoly on it all. Definitely, and it needs it needs to stop. And and hence the birth of the book, the Smarter House Buyer, because people have have got more savvy to what's going on in the world. Yeah, no, you mentioned your book, actually. I know that's just recently come out. So just talk, where is it? What's it about? So it, it's called How to Be a Smarter House Buyer. It's available in Waterstones and uh, on Amazon, uh, paperback and Kindle. And in essence, it highlights the deficiencies in the housing market, which effectively, after the recession, came broken. We're still using similar methods for selling and buying houses and advising people how to get a mortgage that we were doing 10, 15 years ago and it gives buyers tips on how to choose a good estate agent and try doing a, a bit of mystery shopping on yeah, your no, local agents. Yeah, no, that was certainly in an article I've just uh, written actually, um, do, do mystery shop them going behind the scenes and just see how well you're treated as a prospective purchaser if you're looking to sell. I certainly agree wholeheartedly with, uh, with, with that. Again, another phrase that's thrown up is the Rick's Red Book valuation. Now, just to be clear, this is formal valuation. And it's exactly it's what you've talked through effectively, but what is it, and how do you actually go about it? Okay, so the RICS Red Book, uh, it, it's a, it's it, in essence, it's a large book. <laughs> it's red and it's thick as the London Yellow Pages, and it's got a whole load of practice statements and guidelines that we have to comply with to provide a valuation. Now, interestingly enough, when the banks are instructing surveyors in this closed shop environment to carry out a valuation. A lot of companies are not complying to this valuation. So I'll, I'll give you I'll give you another example. Is a lot of a lot of companies will go do a bank valuation on the house, and they won't look in the loft. And that's and there is some practice statements now that says surveyors don't need to look in the loft on valuations. Now to me that's slightly wrong because the loft, which is probably a third of the property. And you know it's often the Pandora's box. It reveals an awful lot of stuff. So if you're again, you're buying. Let's take the average house price. Let's say it's you know, two hundred eighty nine thousand. You're buying a house. You're getting a valuation. You're paying a load of money for it. You're not even getting to see it. You don't know anything about it. And they've only looked at two thirds of the house. How can that be right? 
I quite agree. Uh, I suppose I always like to sort of finish up. You must have, in your many years of experience, had a few embarrassing stories for us, surely. Uh, one of my favourite stories is going to a property as a younger surveyor and walking into the garden of the property. And shall we say the lady wasn't petite? It was a summer's day and she was in a birthday suit. <laughs> and, and, and all I could do was offer her my clipboard, <laughs> but it didn't serve purpose in, in covering an awful lot up, really. <laughs> Need to get a bit bigger clipboard, uh, John. Uh, yes. So, great. <laughs> How can everyone get in touch with you? As I said, you've got a lot of accreditations to your name. Where, where are you based so and what are all can, your contact details? They can get in touch with our Leeds or Harrogate office and if they type in Charters Reed Surveyors into Google, uh, we shall pop up on your screen. You can also contact us on our Harrogate number, which is 01423 259 601. John, thank you so much. Fascinating insight as always. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks very much indeed. Take care. Alex Goldstein's top tip. When you're selling your home, it is the little touches that help. A couple of neat little tricks for you. Firstly, make sure you have your windows professionally cleaned inside and out so they have a sparkle finish to the property. It really does make such a difference, especially on large windows overlooking the garden, say. Another tip is to ensure that any overhead light bulbs are high wattages. If you have the energy efficient versions, ensure that you have them turned on in advance of any viewing so they've got time to warm up and get to full candescence. Equally for side lights, make sure you've got them appropriately positioned in dark corners, but ensure they're a lower wattage. You want your rooms to feel cosy and comfortable rather than emblazoned in dazzling light throughout. As a final point, your front door and to either side should be in show home condition. Repaint your door, have some potted plants to either side. First impressions really do count. That's the Alex Goldstein Property Show and yet again some amazing top tips and features. If you need expert information, videos and up-to-the-minute property news, then head over to my website, alexgoldstein.co.uk. Alternatively, if you require personalised advice when it comes to buying or selling your property, please get in touch directly. The next episode is out on the 1st of March, so make sure you tune in for that. Until next time.